My back to so many of you, I guess I'll stand up here. Um, first of all, thank you so much for, for really taking the, leading the charge on this, Megan, and, and um, all the organizers. It's a, it's a testament to the urgency of the issue to look around this room, quite frankly, and see so many of you here um, on a cold Monday. And it's, it's also, I think, it speaks, the, it speaks to the real urgency that I think all of us feel. And, and there's a frustration that I personally feel when we start talking about these types of issues and you, you understand the importance of it, and then yet you watch various policy decisions along the way. Chris Kilfoyle who is, had a great op-ed in this morning's Eagle, if you haven't read it, um, outlining the precise, precisely what I'm talking about in, when it comes to solar, and maybe I'll get to that in a minute. Um, if you haven't picked up a copy of, of it yet, um, please do. Um, you're speaking at some point today, is that right, Chris? I'm gonna leave the group, but I wanna hear other people's ideas. Yeah, yeah. Um, but my point there is that it's what we need to do is, is basically be very, very specific about the tangible policy choices we're making. And then, of course, what we're, other items today, the result of this is what are the strategies we do to build momentum around 100% renewables? Um, you know, for me, it's, it's been um, really just that. Watch it, like, what is the effort that we're going to do? Is it in the political sphere? Um, in the policy sphere, in the in the kind of the utility sphere, and and you know in the business sphere, and and so I think that's what's it's worth kind of breaking down. When I look at the challenges, the first thing that jumps out at me lately has been the solar um, uh, kind of policy choices, and for me that's meant. Um, focusing on Eversource, quite frankly. So we now have a demand charge that's gonna be going in at the end of the year. And we've seen, and Chris points this out in this morning's article, um, a reduction in, in solar um, new installations by about 21% in the past year. And it kind of attributes it to national level policies, but also particularly now local. Um, and uncertainties around net metering and uncertainties around the next um, smart uh, incentives. And so it, it, it's a very clear example of those policy choices have implications. And so if we want to incentivize a continued movement towards clean, renewable energy, we have to be very deliberate in how we do it, right? And so this is, I hold this up as a very clear example of that. Um, I think we also see, I'm gonna take my name tag off because it's um, just decided not to. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, but we also, we see these, these clear choices that are being made at the, the national level. And so I think that's another thing that just jumps out probably at everyone in this room that it elevates the importance of what you all are doing. It elevates the importance of what all of us are doing at the state level. It elevates the importance of what we're doing at the town level. Um, and I'm glad Tori just walked in and the mayor, I assume, will be here soon. Um, Pittsfield's a great example of serious investments in renewables and being very tangible about creative ways uh, with microgrids, which is what Tori's gonna talk about, um, and the creative and important steps that we can all take with green communities. Um, which is, I guess we're gonna hear about later, you know, commitment to reduce uh, carbon emissions by 20% in five years, getting technical assistance, and, um, and very clear things that we can do to incentivize that throughout the county and the region. Um, we're even trying to work on, at the local level, on a sustainability manager that would be charged with uh, working with towns to make sure that they're, they're making that commitment and being very clear about other efficiencies that we can find, and, and that's a, an important step that we can take locally. Um, I, I started going down the path of the federal level. Nothing has been more frustrating than, um, and this is somebody who spent 10 years in the United Nations, watching the, the federal government dissect and dismantle a very clear uh, movement towards renewable commitments. And I'm speaking specifically about the Paris Accord and withdrawing the United States from the Paris Accord. But I'm also talking about dismantling the EPA. Um, I see a lot of press, so I'm a little reluctant to say this, but I, at the time that, that Trump was sworn in, we, I, I spoke with some, you know, some lower level EPA folks, and they said, God, you know, if, if Pruitt has his way, and if Trump has his way for what he's been doing, we're gonna see a complete dismantling, and we hope that if he's in there for four years, we can, we can slow roll some of this, um, but eight years is gonna be a problem. And it just gives you this sense of just literally deciding a 180 degree policy shift. Um, and all the regulations, in particular, that Obama was putting in place. Um, it's, a, it's a scary proposition, um, and it's one that really, again, puts the emphasis on the state level. And so the good news here, 
is um, we worked with some of you to bring the, the Senate Committee Chair on, on Global Warming and Climate Change for a hearing here at, at BCC um, in, when was that, last summer. And the results of that just came out um, earlier this month, last month. Uh, and, and that is the, a new omnibus package um, on, on global warming and climate change from the Senate. Um, if you haven't taken a look at it, it's a, it's a useful, uh, it's a very comprehensive set of policies that is, um, uh, it, set, it sets a flag in the sand, basically, in my mind. It's saying, guess what, we think that these, these changes are needed, these changes are possible, and, and it really runs a gamut, so I won't take you through the 72 pages of it, but it's everything from um, new incentives, in increasing the amount we're getting from offshore wind, increasing um, the renewable portfolio standards, and, and down the line. Um, and so the good news is um, we hope to take that up in the coming months or so. Um, the bad news is I'm not sure where it's going to go in the House and the governor's desk. Um, and so that's, I flag that as there's, that's a, there's an obvious place for continued work. Um, and uh, I think the other the other piece to pay attention to is you know we've made good good progress on through Reggie, um, but we've also seen that transportation st is stubbornly stuck at I, I want to say around 1990 emission levels. It's it's bad, and we know that 40 percent of our carbon emissions are coming through our transportation, and so. Um, I flag that because the, the chair of telecommunications, utilities, and energy has been very clear that transportation is an area that he wants to focus on. Um, and so I'm glad that you immediately highlighted that as the electrification of our transportation and buildings in particular um, has to take place. You know, the good news in all of this is we know that it's technologically possible, right? We've seen the advances. We've seen that it's, um, it, it, you know, because of technological advances, costs are come down. And so that that's, starts to speak to another challenge that I think we need to focus on is, I often get confronted with, yeah, but the costs aren't there yet. And we already spend so much for energy and electricity, which is absolutely true. Um, but to me, that doesn't mean, therefore, we shouldn't invest in renewables and get to 100% renewable. It means, let's solve the problem of how we get there until we're at cost parity, and let's work with, um, with folks who are maybe heavy in energy industry, or heavy energy users in the county, in the state. Um, and to this, I point to, again, we have examples of how this can be done. And, um, and Germany is one that I, you always hear me talk about, because they've been very clear in, A, investing heavily in renewables, and by the way, it spurred a global um, transformation in renewables, right? When they start investing in it, then China says, well, wait a second, there's a market. We can make it cheaper, and now it's cheaper. So other people are saying, well, the cost has gone down. We can afford that. And you see this virtuous cycle um, spurred by state investment in renewables. And so moreover, they said, okay, well, if, if our investment is going to cost more money for our residents, um, we don't want to put our job creators out of business, so let's, let's create carve-outs and let's create um, kind of economic criteria and credits that you can get. Uh, and so there's a way to have your cake and eat it too. And we need to be very clear about how we're doing that here in the Commonwealth uh, because that's how you start to gain more men momentum and gain more allies and uh, make sure that we're not undermining um, any aspects. Trisha Farley Bouvier, welcome. You're, uh, you missed, my, I really hit my high point about a minute ago. <laughs> oh well. Um, <laughs> luckily she wasn't here when I was talking about the house not doing anything. Um, so uh, anyway, that's, that's the, I, not because you're here, Trisha, but I have hit my major points. And I, I do think that, um, you know, I'm making sure I don't sense. Yeah, I was going to talk a little bit more about the outcome of the 2016 legislation and, and how bids are due for the offshore, off offshore wind um, this summer. And so we're going to be able to start to see the implications of the policy choices that have been made by my predecessor, in particular Ben Downing, uh, in, the, in the whole legislature, and watch very specifically the, the, the tangible implications that that has. And, um, and so I hope that today it can be really clear in that space. Like how do we... How do we reach out to um, prospective allies? You know, I think for me, it's it's clear that we all get it, we all understand what we're trying to do, um, and yet there's a need to make sure that we're not undermined. We're, there's a need when we're talking to colleagues in the legislature who say, "Yeah, but what is that but?" 
And what's the answer? Um, and so I think that looking at the agenda, it's great that you start to be very clear about that problem-solving approach, and that's, that's one that I think we need more of um, in the political space these days. Um, and so thank you all for coming here today. Thank you all for um, dedicating a lot of energy and time to making sure that we uh, lay out clear strategies. Um, and good luck. <laughs> <laughs>